first order of business is, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me in the back? All right, very good. Not without a microphone. I'm sorry? I can't hear you. You can't hear me? Really? I can now. Okay, you can hear me now. Okay. All right. All right. Well, if it, if it, if you can't hear me after a point, just let me know and I'll adjust. Okay. All right, because that's the most important thing if you can't hear it. So, um, anyway, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you all today, and I think it's a very big honor. So, thank you so much. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about what I know most because I've been doing this for my whole life, which is public health. And what comes to mind when you think about public health, um, most people think of restaurant inspections or they might think of um, giving kids shots for vaccinations. But really, public health departments, they do those things, but they also play a very critical role in, and often unrecognized, in promoting and protecting uh, public health. And it's varied over the years, what we've done and what we do now. And so today I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about a little bit of where we came from and where we are today. Okay. So first of all, I'm going to talk a little bit about what public health is. And it's real interesting about public health because it's very diverse. Uh, a lot of times we don't know, um, many people don't really know exactly what it is because we may do very, uh, quite a few different things. Um, one of the reasons I like public health so much is because you can do different things. Um, last week we were working on mosquito control and Zika, but we also, in the following week, might be working on something that has to do with uh, chronic disease or infant mortality or just a clean water issue. As you've probably heard nationally, um, some issues about lead in our drinking water. We've, we've had some issues here in Ohio. So it, it, it depends on what's happening and what's going on, but there's always something new and different to deal with in public health. We're also going to, I'm going to talk a little bit about a story from our past that marked the beginning, or at least modern, uh, modern public health, and then some stories from today. And I just pointed out a few of them. Uh, anthrax, smallpox, and bioterrorism, bioterror something I didn't think I was going to have to talk about in my public health career, but also Ebola and a little bit of an example of what public health can do by talking about a measles outbreak that we had here in Ohio. So just very briefly, this is the state of Ohio and in red is Franklin County where you are. We actually have uh, 1.2 million residents in the county, and we have two health departments that, that serve the residents. One is the city of Columbus that you're sitting in, and then all of that surrounding area, the suburbs, townships, and villages, is Franklin County, and that's who I, I am the health commissioner for. We serve 436,000 res, uh, residents, and we surround the state capitol. The public health system across the country may vary, but one thing that is consistent across the country is that every person in the United States had, falls under the purview of a local health department. So in Ohio, we are very much, uh, we're home rule, local health departments are ro local rule, but there are some that are um, state run, state authority health departments and state run, and then some that are a mixture of that. But everyone is served by a local health department. And for us in Franklin County, this started as a result of the great influenza uh, in 1919. So in Ohio and across the country, many cities already had a health department. They probably started in the mid to mid 1800s. Um, but when the great influenza happened in 1919, it was very clear that there wasn't a public health system to address all the issues that were happening. And so that was the last piece of the puzzle was the 1919 influenza uh, that put health departments, the health department structure, particularly in Ohio together, but also across the country. So then what is public health? Primarily it's prevention, and it's the child who didn't get whooping cough or pertussis. It's the restaurant that properly handled food and nobody got sick. And it's the person who didn't have an asthma attack because they weren't exposed to secondhand smoke. Now, those are hard to measure, 
they're hard to explain to people what didn't happen, and they certainly aren't newsworthy. So when you're hearing about public health in the news, you're not hearing about these things, but this is really where the value of public health comes in. Medical care can prolong life and improve survival, but it doesn't address the disease upstream, which is prevention. And you know, if we have to have a surgery, we want to make sure we have the best surgeon and the best quality hospitals that we have. But we would like to be in a place where maybe we wouldn't need to have like that open heart surgery, that we would have some prevention and some things in our, in our community that keeps us from getting to that point. So there's an important place for both, but we want to try to move more on the prevention end. Um, the majority of public health interventions are cost effective and they result in measurable improvements in public health. So an example of that is childhood vaccinations, which get, you know, there's controversy every now and then about vaccinations. But really, vaccinations prevent 20 million cases of disease, over 42,000 deaths, and save $42 billion, $76 billion um, annually. So this is very important. If you remember, many of us remember, um, I didn't have the measles and mumps vaccine. I had the measles and the mumps. And we grew up in a time where we had those diseases, but there were lots of problems associated with them. And as we move forward now, because people are so used to having those not around, they forget what got us there. And it's very successful vaccination programs. Basically, prevention is public health, and it delivers a real cost-effective way to keep Americans healthy and, and have a high quality of life. And it's really very uh, fun and satisfying to work in a profession where we are able to, our, our goal, our mission, is to help people live longer and to, make it, to live happier and healthier lives. But it isn't always a good story. So I wanted to talk about this particular story of how, um, how public health began. Epidemiology is the basic science of public health. And Dr. John Snow was the, uh, is considered the father of uh, epidemiology because of a cholera outbreak in London, England in 1854. So before we talk about this outbreak, epidemiology is the study of disease origin and the spread. It's the scientific and medical study of, of what makes people ill in a population, looking at the whole population. Why are we a healthy group or are we not a healthy group? Epidemiology studies that. And it really is the basic science of public health. And that's where my background is. I actually was an epidemiologist before I became a health commissioner and was able to do what we call disease detective work. Um, and it, it is really looking at something and saying, what is the cause? The nice thing, the really good thing about epidemiology is you don't always have to know exactly what the underlying cause is to be able to make an intervention that makes a difference. And I'll show you that with the cholera outbreak and then talk about a more modern example of that. So in 1854, there was a cholera outbreak, but it wasn't new. Um, cholera really was a problem in London from about 1831 on. There'd be outbreaks coming and going. Um, and during that time, London, the London population was also increasing. And things that we take for granted today, um, like public water supplies and sewage treatment systems, were not able to keep up with the growth. And there were and just how people disposed of their waste. They had cesspools that may be under their house or in a, in a more common place in the community. Um, and water would come from community pumps. So there'd be these pumps all over town with water that people would go fetch their water and, and go back. So Dr. Snow, he, he would, had studied and looked at cholera and was very concerned that cholera was related to something with the water or something in that manner, but he didn't get a lot of uh, attention about that. Uh, in fact, he, he wrote a paper in 1849 talking about how cholera may be spread 
and he didn't get a, a lot of support for the, his, his concepts and papers. You got to remember the germ theory was not um, anywhere near being understood at that time. In fact, it wasn't until the 1860s. So the concept that there could be something that you couldn't see particularly in the water or in the environment was a little tough to handle. And in fact, the theory of the day was that it was about pollution and it was about um, the air. You know, they're bad air, bad pollution, and you just needed to open the windows and, and have some fresh air. Now, I know fresh air always makes me feel better, but if that's not what's really causing the problem, then it's not going to help very well. So in 1854, there was a really bad cholera outbreak. Um, I think it started in August uh, 1st, and um, it... Uh, the first couple of days, 125 people died. It, the next couple of days, more people got sick. And then there started to be an outflux from this particular area in London, a Soho district. Here's a little, you can't see the details, but that's a map of the area. And the red is the center point where that outbreak was. People started to leave the area. And as they left, of course, the cases went down. But at the end of it, they had 616 deaths due to cholera and many more people ill and sick. So Dr. Snow started out with what is really modern epidemiology. He said, what, you look at clues. What is it about the people who got sick that are different from the people who didn't get sick? And that's how you put it all together. And it is a lot of work. And he didn't have some of the tools that we have today. So looking at 616 deaths was a lot, but he went and talked to people, family members, people who knew them, and asked, started asking them questions. And he started to ask them questions about lots of things, but mostly this particular pump, the Broad Street Pump, which is what is circled in red on this map in London. And all the little dots are all the cases of where they were found. And so he was connecting people, he kept, kept line listings, um, listings of, yes, yeah. And listings of um, where people were and was able to show every one of these people had gotten their water from the Broad Street pump. Then he looked at some other things. For example, well, they had lived near the Broad Street pump. And then he looked at some people who didn't live near there but were able to connect them to the Broad Street pump. Uh, one case in particular was a woman and her niece who particularly liked the taste of the Broad Street from water. <laughs> Which, you know, I'm looking, I read this and I'm thinking, okay. Um, but they actually called for their water from there on that particular day. And both of them died from drinking the water the next day or two afterwards. Because yeah. they really liked the particular taste of that water. <laughs> but other places where, for example, there was a prison right there in the area, but they didn't get their water from the Broad Street from. They brought it from somewhere else, no one got sick. Um, there was a brewery where the people drank alcohol, and because of the brewery process, they did not get sick. But there were some other places where the restaurants served, they would have water and serve people who got sick. So they were, he was able to really pull this all together. And then also look at the other piece of it. Did anybody drink from that pump who didn't get sick? And that's the flip side of it, because that's what you have to look at too. And he found that really he couldn't find people who had drank the water during that particular time who'd gotten sick. So he said, it's got to be the, wa the water in the pump. So he tried to convince the elected officials that it was important to close that pump. And he did have a hard time of it, but they did. And eventually the, the epidemic just completely subsided. So he didn't know why. Now, he, he, his theory was it was something in the water. He couldn't explain why, but that action led to saving people's lives, which is what is really great about epidemiology. You may not have all the facts, and get it, but you're able to make an intervention that makes a difference. Um, and we had such a similar situation, actually, with the connection in the 80s between Rice syndrome and aspirin. And Ohio was one of the uh, places where they were able to do some epidemiology work to find out that kids who had gotten aspirin were more likely to get Rice syndrome. 
and that led to the recommendation that still stands today that you do not give young children aspirin for a fever or illness because of the threat of Rice syndrome. So we don't, you know, eventually we learn what's happening with it, but at the time it's important that you can save lives. The only disturbing thing, you know, and this is the father of the basic science of public health and this is what we're all about, the disturbing thing about this is the Board of Health at the time dismissed the theory completely and was absolutely against closing the Broad Street Pump and still believed in the theory of, you know, the air and the, the, that kind of thing. So it took them a while to get on up to speed on that, even though they were supposed to be, they were supposed to be the people who were um, responsible for understanding those kinds of things. So um, this is just another look at that. This is actually a modern map <coughs> used with GIS that some students um, mapped all the cases to look at in a little bit modern sense. Um, and then this is what stands in this place today. It's the John Snow Memorial, it's a pump, and it's now called Broadwick, Broadwick Street in London. And actually there's, if you're an epidemiologist, you can actually join the John Snow Society and get a look in and, um, you know, if you're so inclined to be thinking that way and being in that kind of uh, mode of being, um, Pretty much a disease detective. So this is what happened. I'm going to skip these. This is what happened and started, and then across the the um, the beginning of the 20th century, um, we had a lot of achievements in public health. Um, once we were able to tackle infectious diseases with vaccinations, clean water, proper sewage treatment systems, incredible. It just was an incredible. Um, achievement and it seems like a little bit but it was an incredible achievement sometimes we take for granted um, that your public health system is still there to maintain that level of achievement um, so it, it's still important to do and when we look globally we're not looking beyond our backyard still the majority of people in the world do not have access to clean water because of these kinds of issues so we're far from globally being able to say we've conquered that. Um, but hopefully here, we still struggle with it a little bit, but hopefully we have a little bit more resources and some things to put in place with our public health system to um, address it. And this is, a, um, this is something that I, you know, as a government employee, public health, we're, gov we're the governmental public health system. System's very big, but we're the governmental local piece. Nothing can be more important to a state than its public health. The state's paramount concern should be the health of its people. And I always try to keep that in mind as we work every day in our, 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 uh, on our issues. <coughs> so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stories of today, because you've probably heard about some of these wherever you're from. Um, and there are things that have changed because of some of these stories. So I'm going to start out with um, September 11th, 2001. It really changed a lot of people personally and professionally. And I can tell you in public health, it changed us very much professionally. We were always involved in emergency preparedness, but it was mostly about floods and it was mostly about a tornado or a fire where people didn't have water or they, you know, we had to put those systems back in place. And we have a lot of experience with infectious diseases. And smallpox was actually eradicated from the face of the earth in 1980. What an accomplishment. Um, actually, I think it was a little before that, but it was declared eradicated in 1980. Um, the last case was actually in 1977. That was pretty, that's a pretty big accomplishment, and actually public health started looking forward. Can we eradicate polio? Can we eradicate tuberculosis and all those other things? Um, but what happened after that, I think it was 11 or 10 or 11 days after that, envelopes got mailed to individuals that had anthrax um, in them. Now anthrax is naturally occurring in the environment, so you're going to see it around farms and uh, dealing with livestock and the soil and things like that, but this is something a little different. It was actually anthrax that was weaponized, aerosolized, to be able to intentionally hurt a lot of people. 
you open the envelope, poof, it, it sprays like a powder, and then you ingest that, and you have, now you have inhal inhalation, inhalation lab. I'm sorry. I just realized, I thought, what was that noise? It was okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. So, and that's worse than, you know, getting it from the soil. So, I think it was a total of five people ended up dying and several others becoming ill um, from anthrax. Anthrax requires that you need to get some kind of prophylaxis, or we call treatment, within 48 hours of having been exposed in order to really assure that you will not die and you will, have, you will recover from that. Um, the problem for us in public health was that this was something that was new to us. Now, these agents used to, to, for harm have been around for a long, long time. But in my career, we hadn't seen any evidence of that <coughs> until this 2001. And so we're thinking about anthrax. Well, how is it spread? It's spread through, did somebody get exposed to the far, at the farm? We're, we're now looking at something completely different from our, our perspective is now having to work more with law enforcement and fire departments and police and, and all of those because now it was a public health issue, but it, it's also a bioterrorist, it's a, a law enforcement, and we had never worked with those partners that closely before. And so we were sitting at the table and the law enforcement were saying, what's my risk? If I, I get a call for this, I have to go in and look at it. What's going to happen to me? How am I going to be protected? What should I be doing? And then the flip side of that was we were saying, what should we be doing? Um, they, and they were very clear, a crime has been committed here. Um, and so there's evidence. And you have to understand chain of evidence. And so we had to learn things that they, they knew, and they had to learn things that we knew. And 15 years later, I can tell you, we have a really good system in place. There is a, we adopted um, the fire system. It's called the Incident Command System. It's what fire departments have been using for years. There's a little bit of a who actually invented it, military fire. But they use it forever as a way to address large events. And so now we are all trained in the same national system. So if something happens, we know we have to go into the incident command system. We know we have to assign people to different roles. And we know we have to work together with our community partners. So during this time, um, anthrax wasn't, there was, there was always a few handful of times that our Ohio Department of Health laboratory would get uh, request because they thought maybe someone had been exposed to anthrax. And at that point, it was mostly law enforcement. During this time, the Ohio Department of Health had 1,600 requests because as this happened, it was real, and so people were thinking there were hoaxes, but also people were thinking, you know, the donut, the powder from the donut, you know, sprayed up. Oh my goodness, there's something on the ground, it looks like that. They were testing everything. Well, since then, it's kind of died down, and we have not seen um, any other um, intentional exposures on a large scale for anthrax. But we do have something called the Cities Readiness Initiative. And every area of the country with, that are large urban areas are covered by this program. Because anthrax can be aerosolized, and can be used as a weapon to really, once it gets ex aerosolized, it can be aerosolized in uh, you know, HVAC systems and things like that. It has the potential to really expose a lot of people. And so we have an initiative where we work with all of our partners and should there be an exposure, should somebody say today somebody dropped something on the city of Columbus, we are able to draw on national resources and get up to speed within 48 hours and be able to start giving people medication so that they can be, um, they can be um, prophylaxed in case they're exposed. Now that's a, a, it's a very big job and you know we don't have a lot of resources to be able to do that, but we have been working on that. And actually, the things we learn and the things that we've done about getting ready for an anthrax clinic or dispensing, um, we've used that when we had the H1N1 pandemic to give out vaccines, um, and we've used it to distribute water to people who were in the middle of a nitrate advisory who didn't have water. 
So those systems work on everyday things in addition to the huge ones. The other thing I wanted to talk about just briefly was smallpox. And in October of that year, we learned that there was going to be um, a three-phase smallpox vaccination campaign. And it was going to start with public health, well, military, but we've always had smallpox uh, vaccination. Public health, hospitals, first responders, and then the general public was going to be vaccinated. This caused a lot of concern because smallpox has been eradicated. So you have to know for sure that you have a real threat. Um, at least from my perspective when we were talking about this, because smallpox is, the smallpox vaccine is not without risks. People die from the small, very small number, and there were also injuries with long-term lasting uh, effects from the smallpox vaccine. Now, when you had smallpox ravaging the countries and everybody getting it and so many people dying, those risks outweighed uh, those benefits outweigh that risk. But flip it around now. No one has, there's no smallpox in any person, and now we're going to give the vaccine and we're going to introduce some risk. So it was very stressful. We also, smallpox vaccine um, isn't like just shooting yourself in the arm with a, a, like a, a influenza vaccine. Mm -hmm. It's a bifurcated needle, it takes some skill. And we weren't even sure we had people who knew how to give them because the last vaccine clinics that we had done for smallpox were in the early 70s. We did have a handful of nurses who had given the smallpox vaccine. We did do, we had a lot of people step up from public health and hospitals who said if there's truly a risk and people are going to have this, I'm going to get the vaccine so I can work to take care of sick people. It only got through that first phase and then it was discontinued and we never had that, we had that threat, but we never saw smallpox materialize as a bioterrorist agent. And so finally, my last thing to say about this is the, there are also monitors across the country that monitor for, for anthrax, um, there's six different infectious disease, disease agents that could be used as a weapon. And they're um, across the country um, monitoring air and we have them in a lot of the big cities so that um, if we ever, if something ever is released, hopefully we will be able to detect it very quickly. So we put all of these things in place and actually it made us better. I mean, like I said, we had the H1N1 pandemic and we were ready to go. We, we can do clinics now. Right now our health department is practicing um, we're going to do a regular flu clinic um, in a big venue and invite people to come and get their flu shot so we can practice doing vac vaccination clinics. But then um, two years ago, Ebola showed up and, and actually the outbreaks in the three countries in Africa were very serious and there was some concern about it coming to the United States. And sure enough, one individual did come to the United States and you probably all heard about it and are aware of it. Um, a patient that died in a Dallas hospital and did expose some of the health care workers. One of those health care workers was on a plane to Akron, Ohio, and so Ohio got involved in this. Um, it was very interesting because Ebola is very different from some of the other kinds of infectious diseases. Like, you know, chicken pox, I could cough up here and probably expose a lot of you because it's that easy to get. But people aren't as afraid of chicken pox, and probably all of us had it as kids. Um, others are a little more difficult, and this one is very difficult. And it's very fierce if you get it. There's no good thing to say about Ebola if you get it. But like some things, you're infectious before you have symptoms. So you could be walking around, you could be coughing on people. If you're in Ebola, you're not infectious if you're walking around. Um, you have to actually have developed some very serious symptoms, and for the most part, you're, you're already in the hospital before you get to that really infectious stage. So the real risk to the public was not really there. But as you can see, we had, um, we had this is a picture of staff um, managing um, 
calls at a call-in for one of our news stations about people being worried about Ebola. But more than just people, um, our, a lot of our elected officials, politicians, um, increase some of that hype. We have a lot of that in Ohio where we were doing things to make people feel good. Running around getting, getting um, this is personal protective equipment, getting personal protective equipment stockpiled without any thought of what kind people need and what they do, and, and that the hospitals have this covered. They do this all the time. They know they're the experts on this and not working with our partners as well as we should. But the, the other thing is, um, I, I got very frustrated because I always thought we weren't being driven by the science. We need to be, we need to have public health prevention, we need to have protection, and we need to be driven by science. And it seemed like it was being driven by fear. And it took me back to when I was the epidemiologist in Columbus working on the new HIV and human immunodeficiency virus, or AIDS. And there was a lot of concern. Everybody wanted to know where that person is, where, you know, we, we would take, um, we have reportable diseases, and we, we track and, and we do surveillance. So we know the names of the people who have these diseases, whether it's Ebola or AIDS or whooping cough. And we take that very seriously. That's not for the whole public. But we can make recommendations to the public. So if we know something, the public is at risk from gathering that information, we can tell you what to do. So there were lots of people saying, you, being very, you need to tell us who was on that plane, where they were, who, who these people are. If they come to our community, we need to know exactly where they live. We heard the very same thing about AIDS patients. Um, if you know where they are, you have an obligation to tell us, even though that person would have no ability to infect someone. Now, we do take that very seriously, and if you had tuberculosis and you could transmit that, we do issue quarantines or isolation on people in modern times, but it's very, very rare because people's freedoms are important, but you balance that with the protection of the public. So I would say that's probably one of the hardest things of my job, whether we were talking about H1N1, um, we talked about it with Ebola when it wasn't necessary, we talked about it with AIDS, but most, I can tell you, most local health commissioners from talking with them around the country take that piece very seriously, that balance between protecting public health and making sure that you're not stepping on anyone's individual rights because it needs to be driven by science. And if science tells you that person can make someone else ill, then we need to do something. The other thing I can tell you is that during the SARS outbreak, um, when they had a big outbreak in Toronto, their experience there with people saying, telling people you have to self-contain yourself at home until your symptoms have passed, most people don't, most people are, want to do the right thing. And so, most people will say, I don't really want to, to, to infect anyone else. But this was also, when we're talking about AIDS or we're talking about um, Ebola or any of these things, I went back to my book that I read the plague years earlier during AIDS, and I had highlighted some things in the book. Um, and this was the one that I think, you know, maybe 100 years from now, they'll still be pulling this out. Everybody knows that pestilences have a way of recurring in the world, yet somehow we find it hard to believe in ones that crash down on our heads from a blue sky. There have been as many plagues as wars in history, yet always plagues and wars take people equally by surprise. So whatever the next one is, it's going to take people by surprise too. And then the last thing I just wanted to talk to you about is a measles outbreak that we had in Ohio in 2014 to illustrate just the value of public health. Um, two Amish gentlemen went to the Philippines to do some missionary work, and they brought back, they were incubating measles when they came back. Now most of us have either had it or now we do vaccinations for it, and we're pretty well protected. But they were in an Amish community where um, the majority of people, over 90%, are not vaccinated. And so they started to um, incubate the disease. At first they thought maybe it was dengue, but then they realized that they had these measles. And I want to just go get the numbers correct here. Okay. Um, OK, 
Okay, this was the largest measles outbreak in U.S. history uh, in 2018. Um, Okay, they had 383 cases of measles in what lasted over uh, a six month period. Um, it started to take off like wildfire because people were not vaccinated. Um, public health nurses and the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, actually came to some of these rural Amish communities and went door to door knocking on the doors. Um, what needed to happen was you needed to get to the people who hadn't been exposed yet and get them the vaccine. And then for those who had it, you had to make sure that they, this is where that isolation and quarantine comes in, isolation of ill people, quarantine of those who were exposed who were not sick. And so they went door to door and knocked on people's doors and had a very good uh, experience with um, people accepting the vaccination. And there were still a small group that would refuse to be vaccinated, but they were able to um, convince others because they were also seeing, um, they were seeing the measles outbreak. For example, they'd go on a knock on a door and they said, you know, if you had measles, you want to be in a dark room. It would be dark inside. They open the door and they see a lot of little kids with red, uh, red dots on their faces. So they understood how bad it was to have it. And so they got vaccinated. But this, this kind of, this illustrates in broad terms what the intervention of public health is. The pink in the background are the number of cases of people who had measles. And you can see that box and it has an arrow and it says that's when the county health departments began setting up immunity vaccine clinics and doing case investigation. And you can see the top line on the top is the number of people who ended up with all three doses of the measles vaccine and as that was going up the incidence of the cases was going down and we have a very similar graph for the h1n1 outbreak uh, when we had the pandemic when you look at the number of people starting to get h1n1 and then you start to see the interventions of the vaccine you actually see the number of cases going down so what ends up happening for us, unfortunately, is you do all these things and then people say, see, it wasn't as bad as we thought. <laughs> so, and that's what they said at age one and one. Okay, I don't know if I could totally prove, that's the proving the negative again. Prevention works. Um, but we, we looked at that. We can't for sure say that's what it was, but and whenever you look at these outbreaks and you look at the, especially when you have a tool like a vaccine, you can see something like that. Okay. And just to let you know, we're not done in public health and with all of these things. Our health department alone in 2009, we investigated 19 outbreaks. And an outbreak is anything that's more than what you might expect. So we have whooping cough outbreaks in middle schools. Um, we have salmonella outbreaks in daycare centers. Um, we have outbreaks going through all the time, but it seems that they're getting to be more and more. We're growing, we're, more, we're in more crowded conditions, and in 2014, and actually in 2015, we had uh, 30 plus outbreaks. So this is kind of a timeline, um, the last, the second half of my career. Um, these are all the things that we had to, we dealt with in addition to all the other things I was talking about. It started with, in 2001 with the anthrax and smallpox. We went through monkeypox. Um, there was also a year in 2005 where there was no flu vaccine. There was a shortage from the manufacturer. And people came out in droves to get that vaccine. Um, so we had those clinics going that year too. Because, but in that case, we had to do a little bit of rationing. We had to limit how many vaccine uh, who got the vaccine and how many doses we had at each clinic because we didn't have enough to give out. Then we had the pandemic. Um, in our jurisdiction, we had a very large Legionella outbreak here uh, in, a, um, in an extended care facility. And um, we, had, we had like 34 uh, cases during that. And it had to do with the 
HVAC system. Brand new facility, everything was done right, but they learned some new things about how Legionella gets into systems from that. And of course, we've had measles, mumps, Ebola. We had a huge botulism outbreak here. Um, and, and it was in a neighboring county where a family um, prepares their own foods. And unfortunately, they had canned potatoes that um, weren't canned properly. And one woman died, and many more became ill. This year, you know, we have Zika. And last year, when I did this presentation for the Torch Club, I didn't have 2016 on there. We were only in 2015. And I had a question mark at the 2016. <laughs> so now I've put in its answer, it's Zika. And we'll see what 2017 holds for all of us. But I just be aware, you have a local public health system. You have a state health system. And, um, People are out there working on these things every day. So hopefully you learn a little bit about um, local public health and what we're hoping to try to do for you. Thank you. Go ahead. Um, I know that Zika is, is on the map this time, but it seems like... Okay. Hi, it seems to me that um, Ebola 